All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this webinar. This webinar is entitled, What is Azure Key Vault? And why is it showing up everywhere? And I will tell you that kind of subtitle is 100% me because I kind of find as I go through more and more things in Azure, uh, Key Vault kind of pops up. So uh, that's, that's really where that's coming from. Uh, I am Tracy Wallace. I am a certified Azure Solutions Architect Expert. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can see my contact information there. And uh, I am I'm desperately light on uh, Twitter followers. So, you know, uh, make my uh, social media person happy and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And I promise I'll, I'll follow you right back. All right. Uh, other than that, feel free to get in touch with me. Any questions or, or anything else related to the course? All right. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about what we are going to talk about in this webinar. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the need for Key Vault. Why is Key Vault important? What do we have there? Uh, and then I'm going to go through the basic Key Vault architecture. Uh, and then we're going to look at using Key Vault. We'll look at it two ways. One, uh, how we can really tie it into Azure resources, and also how we can use Key Vault with custom applications and, and how we can use a Key Vault API so that we can use it to protect sensitive information that we care about. And then finally, we will have a word from our sponsor. I, I am just not allowed to do these things unless I mention INE a little bit, which is cool because it's kind of where I work. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. And by the way, there's going to be as much demonstration as I can fit in here. And uh, I, I got a bunch of them uh, ready and hopefully I, I haven't just jumbled them all together. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. All right, so I'm gonna talk about working with sensitive data. And if you're in IT, you are familiar with working with sensitive data. And really, if you think about this at the highest level, okay, I have some application, I've got a client, client's communicating with the server and the server needs to store some data. And I really wanna keep that secure really throughout that whole process. So how do I go about doing that? Right. Well, if you think about, let's say I'm going to a virtual machine, I'm connecting up to a virtual machine. Uh, let's say it's a web app and that's going against a local disk. Right. Well, you've got BitLocker that you could use if it's in a Windows environment that's encrypting communication to the disk. You've got HTTPS, of course, between the client and the virtual machine. Right. Well, what if I've got. Oh, and by the way, we also have Azure storage encryption uh, in addition to BitLocker. Uh, for our stored disk, whether they're managed or unmanaged, right? But then if we think about maybe a web app, maybe a web app's a little bit more complex. I've got my client, I've got a web app, I've got, uh, you know, SQL Server, a storage account, right? And what do we have there? I've got HTTPS, and then I've got uh, encrypted tabular data stream, if it's a SQL Server, and then HTTPS out to the storage account. Right, so I've got these encryption technologies and, and I even have more advanced uh, capabilities. For example, I've got on the storage side, transparent data encryption for SQL Server. I've got Azure storage encryption uh, for the storage account. Right? But then I also have, uh, as I mentioned, more sophisticated capabilities. For example, always encrypted, which is an encryption technology that uh, takes and encrypts it from the client uh, all the way through to the database in case of SQL Server. And there are, of course, others out there as well, right? But what do all of these depend on, right? All of these ways of securing our data depend on some kind of encryption. And that encryption could be uh, certificate-based, right? Or it could be uh, key-based. And I have a number of these different encryption capabilities that if I want to protect my data, you know, this can start to get pretty complex. And that's really where Key Vault comes into play. Because one way to look at Key Vault is it is simply a way to take those keys, most of them, not quite all of them, uh, but most of those keys and store them uh, independently of uh, each, you know, individual uh, requirement, right? And so I've got a much better management infrastructure. It's secured potentially with hardware security modules. It has uh, very tight access control. It's got audit capabilities, right? And it just makes that, that whole process 
a bit cleaner. Oh, and by the way, you know, I also have things like, say, connections for a web app, right? The data that's going to be not really part of the framework itself, not part of Azure, but really part of your application. Well, you know, fortunately, that can go over in Key Vault as well, right? And, and for me, big picture, you're going to most likely work with sensitive data. You're going to want that data protected. You're going to want it protected at rest. You're going to want it protected in transit. And you're likely going to want to have as much control over that protection as you can. And that, as I said, is where Key Vault comes into play. Now, what I'm going to do, this is not a, a hardcore architecture uh, symposium here. There's no real need for it. But I do want to talk a little bit about kind of the way Key Vault works, right? First of all, we have this entity that is uh, Key Vault. We'll even capitalize it here, make Microsoft happy. Now, within Key Vault, it's going to store data, and there's three types of data that are stored with Key Vault. Okay, I can store, and it's all pretty simple, certificates. I can also store keys, and I can store secrets. Now, certificates are X509 certificates. Keys are standard key files, and we'll talk about the different encryption technologies that are supported for key files. And then secrets are really any kind of encrypted string data that you need to store. Now, these can either be software protected, or you can also set these up so that they are protected by a hardware security module. Okay. Now, in addition to storing this data, Key Vault also, as I mentioned, has strict access control via policy. And it also has the ability to audit to an external store. Now, when I say external store, that could be a uh, log analytics slash Azure monitor. It could be store a storage account, or it could be Event Hub. Kind of these are becoming the standard audit and uh, diagnostic stores for Azure and Key Vault uses those. Now, how is Key Vault accessed, right? Well, you think about Key Vault access as you would with any of the services in Azure, the resources in Azure, and you have two things. You have the management plane and you have the data plane. All right, and if you're developing apps or using apps, then you need to integrate with both of these. Fortunately, although it's really in two parts, you can do that via an API. And specifically, and I should have done this in the, re in the uh, reverse order, I've just made up a new way of, of saying REST API. But if you're familiar with Azure and you're familiar with the way that you work with Azure, you know that behind everything there's a REST API. And that typically does apply to both the management plane and the data plane. Now, by management plane, I mean things like, you know, provisioning key vaults, setting up policies, right? Those are things that would be management plane, whereas the data plane is accessing things like keys and secrets and certificates. Now, there are also tools in front of the REST API. You don't have to go REST API. Uh, you've got things like the portal. And there's also quite a number of SDKs, libraries, that make it easier. And I'm going to show you one of those. I'm a .NET kind of guy, so uh, I typically use that as uh, my demonstration platform because that's one I know I'm least likely to make a mistake. Not impossible, but certainly least likely. All right, so these are all of the big picture components of Key Vault and how it works. Let's go and talk a little bit about some more of the details for the architecture. Okay, first of all, management. Uh, it is possible to, uh, as an option, to use a uh, hardware security module. 
Uh, this is FIPS 140-2 level two compliant. I will tell you right away uh, before I see a question come in on that, I am not a security guru. So uh, that's one of those things where if that means something to you, fantastic, it's good security. Uh, beyond that, I'm not gonna be able to go too deep into that discussion. It does have an audit trail, which I think is very important. However, one thing that's interesting, and I'll show you this, is you actually have to set that audit trail up. Uh, and there's also access control. Uh, you have at the management plane, you've got standard role-based access control that you have with any of your Azure resources. Uh, but then at the data plane, we have, as I mentioned, access policies, and I'm gonna show you those. Now for certificates, if you're storing certificates, you can upload certificates, you can upload your own. You can also generate certificates directly in uh, Key Vault. And that's kind of interesting because effectively Key Vault is, is kind of a, uh, you know, a certificate uh, issuer. All right, you can generate self-signed, so just right there within Key Vault. You can also connect to certificate authorities. Now there's two certificate authorities that are integrated. I've got DigiCert and Global Trust. If you're using either of those, you can actually configure Key Vault uh, to manage keys generated by those services uh, within your Azure environment. Right. Uh, now, if you're using keys, there's two types of keys. There's RSA keys and elliptical keys. Okay, and you can see the key lengths for both of those that are available for generation. I will say if you have your own key files and you're uploading them and you want to use those uh, in Key Vault, you have to make sure they have the right format. Uh, for example, I've generated keys using PuttyGen, if you're familiar with that, uh, and they don't natively go directly up into Key Vault. I need to uh, convert them a bit. Uh, also, depending on what you're doing, there are some limitations. For example, uh, let's see if my memory serves me here correctly. Uh, the disk encryption, disk volume encryption, uh, which would be BitLocker uh, or DMCrypt if you're in Linux, it relies on RSA. It's not yet uh, available for, or elliptical is not yet available for that. Okay, but that's of course all well documented. And then secrets are really pretty much whatever you need for your application. Configuration settings, for example, connection strings, right? These are things that are part of an application, a common part of an application, but you don't necessarily want those uh, out in uh, plain view, right? And so we have that. All right, now using Azure Key Vault for Azure resources. What are some of the things we have? All right, first of all, uh, TLS certificates. Okay, so if I have a web app and I want HTTPS connectivity, I can use Key Vault as a source of a custom certificate uh, for that. Disk volume encryption keys, uh, pretty straightforward. If you've got virtual machines and you're running disk volume encryption. Okay. Storage account encryption keys. I can actually uh, take those out of Key Vault, use Key Vault as a storage there. Uh, for SQL Server, if you're using transparent data encryption for SQL Server, you can manage those keys in Key Vault. And this one is really one of the biggest ones for me, ARM template secrets, right? I'm gonna show you an example of this where if I'm deploying a, an ARM template and I'm deploying a virtual machine or I'm deploying a uh, database server that needs a username and password, I don't really want to either have those, certainly not in plain text in a template, right? Or otherwise have to kind of have them somewhere that equates to plain text. But what I can do is I can tie very easily uh, into my Key Vault and use that to store my uh, secrets that I would use in an ARM template. Uh, there are some other things here, Apache uh, Kafka, one moment. I wanna make sure I don't lose where I am, there we go. Okay, uh, so Apache Kafka on Azure HD Insight. And if you ask me questions about that, I am not a, an HD Insight. I'm not a Hadoop person or an Apache Kafka, but I'm just telling you, it is there. Uh, also, data lake storage. Uh, you can use your own key to encrypt data lake, data lake storage. Uh, Azure Site Recovery. 
and there's certain times where you have to use it. And then also if you're using store simple, uh, that is uh, available as well. Now there is a great site. Let's see if I can pull it up here without breaking anything. Okay, right here. This is, it's just a page, uh, Microsoft Azure Data Encryption at Rest. And you may want to take that down. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I will actually put this in the chat window. So you can copy it out of there if you're interested, because if you're interested in seeing uh, what Key Vault can be used for, this page is fantastic. It's right here, I'm on it, I've got a table. Okay, and saying, okay, here's server side using service managed key. That means that Microsoft is managing the key. Uh, and then there's server side using customer managed key. And anything that's customer managed key is going to be key vault. Okay, and so I'm not gonna go through all of these. This is literally where I derived that list that I just showed you from. Uh, but uh, it is a pretty comprehensive list of what can be encrypted and what you can use key vault for so that you manage the encryption of these technologies, whether it's at rest or in transit. All right, now we're gonna have a little bit of fun. Okay, now we're gonna go into a demonstration. We're gonna take a look at disk volume encryption. We're gonna take a look at storage account encryption, and we're gonna look at ARM template encryption. Two of these I didn't practice beforehand, so who knows? Hopefully they'll go right. All right, uh, we're gonna start out, I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out with disk volume encryption. And I'm gonna bring this up, okay? Uh, and let's go to my resource group. And I've got right now two virtual machines. I've got the disk encrypt VM, which is actually already encrypted. And I've got a 2B encrypted VM. And I also, somewhere around here, not quite in the right place, there we go. All right, I have a script, okay? And let's see, I've got to get the VM name. This is to be encrypted, VM. The fun thing about being an instructor is I don't have to have any real rational kind of naming convention, so we have that. All right, and this, by the way, is uh, Visual Studio Code. I'm starting to use this uh, for my PowerShell because I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated uh, with uh, PowerShell ISE, all right? If you're not familiar with this environment, I'm just running PowerShell commandlets, and these PowerShell commandlets, by the way, literally come directly from here. I'm sorry, I didn't create this, but the good news is if you're interested in recreating this, that too is in the chat. So lots of links there. All right, in any case, I'm gonna come down here. Let's pick that one and let's run it. Okay, so I'm looking at the disk encryption for that. And I just realized I probably did not actually run the rest of my variables, unfortunately. Let's see if I can get that to run. All right, well, right away, first demo. Good thing I was blazing through this because uh, we're gonna we're gonna come back and take. Oh, there we go. Took me a minute, but it did get it. All right, so you can see for this VM, this disk encryption uh, VM, it is not encrypted, right? You can see those, no encryption extension, okay? And we're good. Now, if I wanted to encrypt this virtual machine, uh, what I would do, I think I ran that one, is I'm gonna get information on the key vault that I want to use. Now, in this case, I'm using a key encryption key. You can either just create the encryption key directly or you can have your own key encryption key that you can create and then that in turn creates the actual encryption key 
for your disk. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and just grab that information or run that information. And all that's doing is getting uh, some really settings. I retrieve the key vault and then I get various properties uh, from the key vault. So if I wanna see that, that's all of the key vault. Here's my key vault. And just as an example, there's the key encryption key URL that I have for the encryption key. Now, it's actually pretty straightforward, and this is the more complex of the two options. All right, uh, it's really just one call. It is actually an extension that gets installed uh, onto your virtual machine. Uh, there's, of course, a Windows version, and there is a Linux version. All right, and in this case, because I'm in Windows, it, of course, is going to uh, deploy the Windows version. And most is pretty simple. I deploy to a resource group name, uh, a virtual machine name, makes sense. Uh, the key vault URL that I want to use, uh, the disk encryption key vault uh, ID, you need both of those, the URL to the key itself, and the key vault ID for your key encryption key. And that's kind of important. I am using one key vault for both of these, but you would typically in production, you'd want to separate that out, right? You'd protect your key encryption key in one key vault and have another key vault uh, for the actual encryption key itself. But once I have all of that, pretty straightforward, I just run that. And that is not going to be terribly exciting. It's going to run in the background. But fortunately, I already have an example keyed up, no pun intended. It's amazing how much I use the word key when I'm talking about key vault. I think that is a uh, uh, issue just, uh, just for me. Anyways, I had previously encrypted this virtual machine running literally that exact same script, which again is available uh, and I've given it to you. Uh, although I see that uh, Maurice is saying, or excuse me, Mauricio is saying that you don't see any links. We'll make sure if the links don't go through on the chat, I'll make sure that they get on an email uh, that can be sent out to everybody. Our marketing person doesn't know that yet, but uh, we'll go ahead and, and we'll make that happen. So I'll make sure you get the links to these, uh, and I apologize that you're not seeing that. Okay, what I wanted to do with this is I wanna show you the activity log of this particular virtual machine. And there's a reason for this. This virtual machine is set up with disk encryption, and I can show you that also ask you to just take my uh, my word on that. But what I did earlier is I deleted the key. I backed up the key and I deleted the key. Actually, the key is stored as a secret, ironically, uh, for this particular virtual machine. And then I tried to start it, right? And if I look at this, uh, it tells me that it started even though there was a failure and I could look in here. I should somewhere in here get the uh, that's just the begin request. Okay. Um, there's the failure. All right, that's my failure. And somewhere in here, it's going to tell me, there we go, unknown error occurred when retrieving secret from the key vault. That's because I deleted the key in the key vault. And then I went and I restored the key and I started the virtual machine. And I think it's actually up and open over here somewhere. No, I closed it, but uh, it's running. Okay. And uh, how did all of that happen? Well, if I go to the actual key vault. So first time we're going and taking a look at the actual key vault. I come in here and I've got two things. First of all, if I go to keys, I have my disk encryption key, uh, encryption key. So this is the key that encrypts the encryption key. Uh, kind of cool. All right, and then I've got secrets, and here is the actual, you can see, wrapped binary encryption key. Uh, this is actually the encryption key that was used, used to encrypt those, uh, the, well, in this case, just one volume because I just have the OS. Uh, if I had data disks, by the way, it would have encrypted them as well. Okay? But in any case, that is uh, how you encrypt a virtual machine. Again, really the only thing kind of complex about it, it's still running on the other virtual machine, is getting all the key vault information. But uh, like I said, it's actually frankly very well documented 
by Microsoft. So it's pretty easy to get. All right, let's take a look at some other things that we can do uh, for encryption. Really, frankly, pretty straightforward. Okay. Other tools that we can, or other resources we can encrypt, I have a storage account. Okay. And if I go to configuration, uh, actually encryption, there we go. Uh, this is, by the way, storage accounts now are going to have encryption at rest. You're gonna have storage account encryption. Okay. By default, that's a, based on a key that is managed by Azure. If you want to manage your own key, you can do that. I could select that and then select, we'll use my disk encryption key, why not? Okay, and now I am managing the encryption key for my storage account. There we go, easy enough. Right, so now that's in my hands and not in Azure's hands. Not that I don't trust Azure, it's just wanna make sure that uh, we, we have that. All right, or we have access to that if we need it. All right, so there you go. Now I'm gonna show you what is arguably what I think is the most powerful kind of system-based uh, capability and powerful is probably not the right word. It's really about the fact that uh, this is, I'm gonna create a project, there we go. This is something that's pretty common, right? And this is something that there's what I would consider to be a universal need for. It's absolutely critical, of course, that you have your content encrypted at rest, right? But in some cases you can make the argument, hey, that's already happening. It's just whether you're managing the key or Microsoft Azure's managing the key. With what I'm about to show you, this is something that I think anybody who's working in Azure should probably be familiar with templates. And if you're deploying via template, you're probably gonna have these secrets and you need some way of securely managing them. And that's really what I'm going to talk about uh, right now. All right, so I'm going to create a somewhere around here, Azure Resource Group. This is just, by the way, Visual Studio. I'm opening up Visual Studio only for convenience and only really just to show you that this is from scratch, right? This is completely uh, from a, a zero point build here, KV deployment, all right? And create. And it's gonna ask me what I wanna create and I'm gonna be a bit lazy here and I'm just gonna go ahead and just select Windows Virtual Machine and I'm gonna hit okay. It will take a moment, but it doesn't take too long. And of course, it opened it up on the other screen. All right, here we go. All right, now, what I'm gonna do without even looking at this, I'm gonna go ahead and deploy this. Let's deploy this to my actual INE account. I promise there'll be a payoff here. Actually, it doesn't matter where I deploy it to because I'm not actually deploying it. All right, we'll leave that alone. No, we won't leave that alone in case I accidentally deploy it. One moment. Well, well, that's oh, that is much faster. All right, Key Vault webinar. And we go in here to edit parameters. Now I need to specify an admin username. Okay. Now the next thing I would need to specify whether I'm doing this uh, as you know part of my configuration of my uh, parameters file, if you're familiar with those. Uh, or if I'm gonna do this and, and have to specify this value when I, when I actually deploy this template, right, it needs an admin password. What I don't wanna do is I don't wanna type something in here. Right? That would be bad, right? because that means particularly if I save this file, that means I've got a password that's in plain text somewhere, not a good thing. However, neat little feature in Visual Studio, save this value in Key Vault. Okay. And what I can do is 
I can go into Key Vault, and I actually have an existing Key Vault here where I have the administrative password that I use. And I am simply going to hit OK. And oh, I need a DNS name. And I'm going to save that. Now, I'm not actually going to deploy this because, frankly, that's kind of boring. But I do want to show you what that just generated. Okay. Hopefully, you don't think the rest of this is boring. That would be, though. All right. Here, I've got a uh, parameters file for a templated deployment. Now, if, if this is just being thrown at you and you have no idea what templated deployments are, that's really not a big deal, OK? Template deployments allow me to specify infrastructure as code. Really, almost any resource in Azure, I can specify, a, specify out a description file effectively uh, in a format called JSON and deploy that. And it's going to take care of a lot of the complexity of deployment. I use them all the time, right? And they have parameters that let you redeploy it and, and change the values. Right. Well, well, all I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, this deployment has this, this parameter, admin password, right? Clearly, it's a password, even if you don't know what it does. Obviously, it's a password. Well, rather than giving it a value, I'm giving it a reference. Simply as that. Simple as that. And there we go. Right there. Now, I can deploy this, and it will pick up that value. However, the reason I can do that is because I have configured Key Vault to support that. Okay, and I'm gonna show you how you would do that. So hopefully that's clear, okay. All right, now uh, what I wanna do is I wanna go back to my Key Vault or go to my Key Vault. Here's my Key Vault, okay. And I'm gonna take a moment to talk about the access control in Key Vault. Now, like any other resource in Azure, I have my control plane access through role-based access control. So I can assign roles, and I can see the roles that are currently assigned, right? And standard roles, contributor, owner, et cetera. But what matters much more is access policy, okay? And so access policy defines who and what can access Key Vault, right? And I can go a couple things. I'm showing advanced. Now, right now, and I don't think there's a way to go out of advanced, these three check boxes at the top of this are critical because these allow Azure functions, Azure functionality, not Azure functions, to integrate and to use Key Vault. So I've got Azure Virtual Machines for deployment. I'm going to check that. Azure Resource Manager for template deployment. I'm going to check that. And also critically, Azure Disk Encryption for volume encryption. So one of the things I didn't tell you when I showed you volume encryption is that works because I have these three check marks. Now, in addition to that, I can add an access policy that will allow me to define key permissions, say all of them, secret permissions, say just get and list, for example, but you can see all the different uh, secret permissions and separately certificate permissions. Now, if you want, I'd say, okay, I just want to use a template here, key and secret management. And those are the options there. Then I need to assign that to a principal. And then that's if you've worked with Azure, kind of a standard principal lookup. And I've got, fortunately, two of these INE, uh, whoops, KV webinars. Those are managed identities. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then I would add that. And simple as that, that's going to give that identity, whether it's a user or a service principal or managed identity, access to Key Vault and controlled access to Key Vault. All right, so those are some ways that I can interact with Key Vault uh, at the service level. Now what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to talk about how I can interact with Key Vault at the application level. And that's actually relatively straightforward. Okay, there's a couple things. First of all, Key Vault can be used with SQL Server always encrypted. This is something that to me was absolutely huge because SQL Server's had official encryption included in it since 2005. 
I've never really been a fan of that because it, I always felt there was a vulnerability there for my very sensitive information that if somebody were to get access uh, to the SQL Server as an administrator, they'd have access, they'd have the capability to get access to the actual data, right? I always want to encrypt my sensitive data with a key that is not managed in the actual database itself, right? So uh, my preference is to have that external key. I used to do that in apps I wrote, and I would manage that key completely separately. Well, now with SQL Server always encrypted, I can have that external key and manage it in Key Vault, for example. Uh, which makes life a lot easier. We're not going to go down that road because that's a pretty complex road. And if you don't have that workload, it's not going to matter. But do know that it exists. Another capability that I think is actually really important is app service settings. There is actually a way that you can directly uh, correlate your app service settings if you have you know, a web app or an API app uh, to use Key Vault. Okay? And I can do that at the app service level. Also, honestly, if you're using ASP.NET Core, uh, there's an easy way you, you can implement an extension so that you get your configuration options directly out of Key Vault, which is pretty cool. Okay, but then there's also an API, and I mentioned this before. Okay, there is a REST API, which means effectively it's universal. The REST API, though, can be a little bit tricky to use. So there are SDK libraries, as you can see right now, for four major platforms. And, uh, .NET, Java, Node.js, and Python. All of those have uh, APIs, they have libraries, objects, to make it easier to interact with Key Vault. All right. And now what I want to do is I want to show you a demonstration, uh, a fairly simple demonstration of using Key Vault, using the Key Vault API. Okay. Now, if you're not a developer, I'm going to try and not bog it down too much. I will tell you that what I'm about to show you is an ASP.NET Core MVC application. Uh, I am managing this from my uh, Visual Studio 2019 environment. Okay? And I have included libraries that give me the ability to interact with Key Vault. And I can show you what this does in turn oh actually to show you what it does i'm going to pop over and show it to you online and then i'll show you the code behind it okay so this is a deployed instance of that app service and it's loading up in the background right now and right now you'll notice that sql server i've got sql server I've got MariaDB and I've got a storage account, okay? And I'm connecting and retrieving data from all three of these. But right now I don't have any configuration options set for that. So uh, if I use Key Vault, however, and refresh them, now they're all retrieving data, okay? And I'm gonna show you kind of how that's differentiated because the point of this is first of all, it works. Okay, the reason this works is because this web app has a managed identity and that managed identity has a policy that allows it access to certain keys in Key Vault. Okay, and those keys, before I flip back, I jump a little bit over. So that's the, uh, the actual web app and it's accessing keys. And I've got three keys that Matt, or three secrets, excuse me. All right, I've got a secret that is key. I've got a secret that is password. And uh, I also have a secret that is username. The use KV doesn't actually do anything, All right? So this would be sensitive information that I wouldn't necessarily want in a configuration file. Now I could put these in a configuration file and that would work, but then I would consider that data to be somewhat vulnerable. Okay. Let's take a look at how I actually uh, work with that. Okay. Again, not worrying about getting too bogged down in the uh, details of the code, okay? This is where I retrieve my values from a configuration file, right? Which is a standard concept in ASP.NET Core, okay? But then if one of those settings says to use Key Vault, then I run this get settings from Key Vault. 
And I'm just going to go over there. And let's see if I can't give myself a little more space. There we go. All right, these lines of code right here represent, and it's about, what, eight lines of code, represent all the code that I need to pull that data out of Key Vault. And in fact, really, there's only two lines of code that set me up with the connection to Key Vault. That's kind of impressive. Now, I can do that because I've pulled in a library. Right? I'm not going to go down that road too far. But what this means is that with very little development overhead, your developers can integrate Key Vault capabilities. And frankly, if you're using Visual Studio and you're using a, a .NET Core, uh, ASP.NET Core, other .NET Cores, you can actually even set up a complete development environment where your developers have their own secret keeper on their machine. And then when they deploy up, it actually will pick up the fact that it should be using Key Vault. Very cool stuff. But the point is, I can integrate into my applications, again, this very uh, secure way of storing sensitive data that is, that is used in a custom way by my applications. That, I think, is pretty cool. All right? And that is that for the uh, demonstration of how you can use Key Vault. But I'm going to make things a bit more complex here. And that is to say this entire demo is about Key Vault, right? And being able to use Key Vault so that I don't have to have things like connection strings stored in plain text, right? But you can also use Azure AD. And that's something where uh, I can avoid the whole concept, potentially, of having sensitive data in the first place. Okay? Uh, one of the key ways that I can use that is with Azure SQL Server authentication. Okay? Uh, meaning that if I've got my data in Azure SQL Server and I've got a uh, web app that is using uh, a connection to that and it's using a managed identity, uh, I can actually connect up to SQL Server without putting a username and password anywhere, which is pretty cool stuff. Um, you can also use this for storage account access, although I haven't done that yet, so I can't give you too much details, but I know it is there. Last time I was, I was excited to play around with it was in uh, preview, and I try not to do too much in preview. All right, what I want to show you, though, is how this would work as an alternative, kind of even that next layer of protection, uh, relative to Key Vault. The advantage of Key Vault is that it's much more ubiquitous, right? If you have sensitive information, if you have connection information to anything, you can put that in Key Vault, protect it, and relatively easily get to it. Uh, the advantage of Azure AD is that that sensitive data for connections in these limited ways doesn't actually need to be stored anywhere. All right, let's take a look at how you might implement this. All right. I've got a, too far back there, I've got a database and a database server. For some reason, I have two database servers. On my database server, one of the options that I have is Active Directory Admin. And in order to be able to use Azure Active Directory with an Azure SQL database, you have to first set up an Azure Directory Admin, and that's me done that. Now, the other thing that I have done is in the actual database, I have added in this KV demo database, okay, I have added a group to the uh, DB data reader uh, role, database role, right? Meaning that if you're in that Azure AD group, that will give you access to the database, okay? Now, right now, I have not added my managed identity. Well, I think I took the managed identity out of that group. If I refresh, perhaps I added it back in. Oh, I must have added it back in. Let's try one more time. Oh, I did, great. Well, I can at least show you that and why that works. All right, that was not a massively impressive demo, but if I go over here to Azure Active Directory, 
And if I go to groups, I've got this SQL access group. And there we go. There's a member. Oh, I think I did that so it wouldn't fail if I forgot to do it. All right, so here is the managed identity for my web app. Now I'm gonna go ahead and remove that managed identity. And I'm gonna refresh. And that takes a little while to remove, but eventually that will come back, I swear, and the SQL Server uh, will show that it's, it's not uh, there anymore. And um, that is one thing with Azure AD changes, sometimes they do take a little bit of time. All right, um, that's kind of what Azure AD does, right? It gives you this ability to manage sensitive data in the form of certificates, key files, and secrets, which are just encrypted strings, uh, that you can access through an API. It's controlled access uh, via the policies, right? And again, it works both on the uh, management plane as well as the data plane. Now, there's one other thing that I wanna show you, and that is auditing, right? Because if I have this high security capability, I definitely wanna be able to audit. I mentioned that auditing is available. Let me take just a moment to show you how you would implement auditing for your key vault. Because it, this is one thing that I will say I think should be automatic and it should be a bit more straightforward, right? Because if I'm using key vault, there's a very good chance that auditing is gonna be important to me. But the good news is it's easy enough uh, to set up. All right, I'm gonna go back. I should just go back to my dashboard and I'm gonna go to my key vault. And in the key vault, and again, it doesn't say auditing settings, it says diagnostic settings. I'm gonna go to my diagnostic settings. And this is kind of, a, if, if you've used Azure for a while, you might consider this kind of a new approach. This is what I call kind of the standardized approach to uh, setting up diagnostics now. And what you can do is you can say, okay, I want diagnostics to go, and I'm not actually gonna create this one, but uh, we'll say delete me. And I have three choices, uh, storage account, event hub, log analytics, right? And so I go log analytics, event hub, and I can do all three and choose. Okay, I wanna just make sure the audits go there or I could also uh, have metrics, usage metrics. Okay, uh, now I've already done this. I'm gonna discard this, but this you have to do. Okay, so I've already set up a diagnostics and that is writing my diagnostics to a log analytic. And I've gone into my uh, monitor and okay, I have added a solution to Azure Monitor and I've configured it, okay? And I literally came over here and I went to add and I looked for Key Vault Analytics, right? And added that. I'm not gonna add it again because I already have it, but that's how I got the Key Vault Analytics in there. And then I went in, I configured this to use my key vault, to use the data from my key vault. And so if I go in to key vault analytics, I can see all of the different operations that have occurred, all right? And this is over the last 24 hours. And what do you know, I have been testing this quite a bit. A lot of secret gets, okay? Uh, I had some not found failures. That's when I had deleted uh, the uh, key, the, the secret for my disk encryption, okay? And you can see broken down by latency, okay? Uh, average operational latency for these different operations, okay? And what I wanna do though is I wanna take a look at my secret gets. And I click that and it's going to give me details. Uh, and this is audit data. So these are all of the secret retrievals. If I go and I expand that out, I can see who retrieved this. And what they did. There's client info. All right. There's the request URI. That's how they came in. Okay. There's the resource ID that they 
went against, and somewhere in here is the key. Ah, right here. Now, that key, D-A-B-A, -A, that's my disk encryption key. Okay, that's not a very fun one. Let's see if we can find one that is not my disk encryption key. There we go. There's the secrets username. Okay, so I can actually track down when that username was accessed. I can see my uh, app ID that accessed it. Okay, and I can see the resource ID, the subscription ID, and quite a bit of additional information. So you do have a complete audit log available for your uh, Azure Key Vault. It's just not necessarily quite as straightforward to get it as I would like. All right, one more thing, a word from our sponsor. It's actually kind of two more things. All right, uh, if you are new to i &E, we are now pretty much subscription-based learning. We will be certainly for Microsoft. I joined uh, this year with the task of building out our Microsoft portfolio. Uh, and so that is, that is going, and, and as you can see, lots of things are starting soon or coming. Um, we've got, we're building right now Azure Learning Paths, Microsoft 365 Learning Paths, and uh, Windows Server Learning Paths. All right, and all of these are aligned to certification, but my goal is to deliver expert training. That's one of the things I love about i &E. You know, yes, there's exam prep capability, but it's about, you know, making you an expert. And if I've done my job right, you go through and you digest all the information in these courses, you know, you're gonna come out an expert who happens to be able to pass an exam. Uh, the paths that we have, uh, we've got the Azure Solutions Architect expert that's in progress and actually covers a good bit of uh, Key Vault in a couple different places. Uh, once I'm done with that, I'm going to be starting the Azure Administrator uh, learning path uh, for the what is now AZ-103 exam. Uh, eventually, uh, and either I or someone else is going to be doing both developer and DevOps. Uh, Microsoft 365, uh, we've got teamwork just about to start. Uh, up. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in. Uh, we also have uh, Enterprise Administrator Expert. Actually, that's going to be one path uh, together. And Modern Desktop, i.e. Windows 10. All of those are starting soon. And we have planned for Messaging Administrator for those of you interested in Exchange Online and other things. Uh, and we also, as I mentioned, we do have an MCSE core infrastructure for Windows Server 2016 uh, that is uh, getting pretty close uh, to finishing up. We've got a few courses already out there for that. Uh, now, I'm going to show you one other uh, website here. And that is the website that is the landing page for this learning path. It's pretty cool. We actually picked up the AZ300 URL. And there we go. Here's our learning path. All right. And the way a learning path works is it's designed to cover a range of courses that take you to a goal. In this case, the goal would be uh, being an Azure Architect expert. Okay. And we've got some introductory courses. Uh, you've got an overview, uh, prep and overview for the AZ300, right? giving you exam. Hence, it's not giving you details or anything like that. It's not a brain dump. Uh, but it does, you know, kind of tell you what to look for, what you need to study as you go through our course and other study material. Uh, some prerequisites, if you're brand new to Azure, those are up and running. And these are actually all four of these, they, they just, uh, these last two got updated yesterday. They, they're in there, uh, but they haven't been updated on the landing page yet. Uh, so we've got four different courses for the 300, uh, correlated to the 300 exam. And we also have six courses, uh, one of which is done, the others are coming within the next couple weeks, ideally, uh, that correlate to the exam objective domains for the AZ-301 exam. Okay. And so this is kind of how we are putting together our learning paths, uh, trying to make it easier for you if you are interested in certification. On the one hand, you know, you've got a path where you can learn that, but even if you're not interested in certification, Right. This is this is about becoming an expert in this. So that's pretty much it from me. Uh, I will make sure that we get you the URLs and 
I'm gonna look over to our extremely capable uh, social media expert, uh, Brittany. Brittany, am I good? Do I need to say, all right, Brittany's giving me the thumbs up. Uh, I'm not seeing any open questions, so I'm just gonna assume that means I presented this so amazingly well that there could not possibly be uh, any questions. Uh, no, you do uh, in the video, and, and I put it out there, do have my contact information. Uh, like I said, feel free to email me, uh, you know, uh, follow me on Twitter because I desperately need Twitter followers. And um, other than that, thanks again for being part of this. And Brittany, do I need to turn it over to you for close up? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Brittany and I'm going to mute my mic so we don't get feedback. But again, thank you so much.